Okay, hi everyone. My name is Ryan Goulding. I'm from Brocade. This is my colleague. So uh, today we had scheduled the topic uh, on NetConf usability. And this is kind of, you know, from AG feedback as well as our own personal experiences uh, dealing with it. So um, kind of just a funny uh, cartoon here, but sometimes I guess we all feel like this when using NetConf. <laughs> I want to just put a disclaimer. I think, you know, the NetConf team does a, a stand-up job. This is meant to be constructive and just, you know, something then. <laughs> there are a lot of smart people in this room, too, so if you, if you feel like you have something to add to the conversation, we'll pass the microphone to you, and, you know, please feel free to pipe in. Um, so, you know, a lot of good features were added in, in Beryllium, um, some improved logging, uh, spawning via topology configuration instead of loopback, um, clustering, and I actually added the last one here, which is the custom schema cache directory per netconf mount, which allows you to essentially uh, create a repository for each individual mount. So you can go into that repository and modify and munge the model if it doesn't seem to be uh, taking well. So as an outline, we're going to go over a little bit of advisory group feedback. Actually, most of this is driven by advisory group feedback. Then we're going to go through examples of, you know, plausible improvements and discussion at the end. And again, I want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, I know this is kind of a formal sort of presentation right now, but please pipe in if you have anything that you want to add. I'd really enjoy hearing it. I think it's only going to lead to good things. So advisory group feedback. So the first piece of advisory group feedback that <laughs> I received was Distinguish between NetConf protocol issues and Yang schema conformance in the payload. Basically what this means is when you do a NetConf mount or, you know, a get operational or get config, <laughs> no worries. Uh, sometimes you'll get a really nasty, you know, uh, exception admitted from org open daylight Yang tools, even though you're really doing NetConf. And this is the point where, you know, they're kind of indistinguishable. Uh, NetConf is definitely, you know, downstream of Yang tools and highly dependent on it. So, you know, the first point is really, we want to be able to tell what's going wrong when it goes wrong. We don't want just a Yang tool stack trace. Uh, they're very helpful, but unless you're directly involved in writing the code and you know Yang tools pretty well, you're probably not going to know what went wrong. Maybe your model is deficient and uh, don't really know where it is. At this point, too, it's very hard to tell which model actually broke the uh, whatever specific net comp operation you're performing. Another piece was, uh, you know, a loose mode. And uh, this is both for Yang and NetConf. This one's a little bit more debatable. I've heard both ways on this one. So, you know, when I talk to Robert, he often says that application developers really want to uh, depend on the model and the validity of the data as it's enforced by Yang. But there are certain cases where, you know, Maybe my, my device doesn't have a, a, a type for a leaf, for example. And, uh, you know, I still want to use it. I still want to use the model. Maybe I can just assume the string type just so that it will load. Um, and, you know, the point at the bottom is you, this has to be optional. This has to be a strategy pattern because there's certainly a lot to be said that, you know, it's made it through the Yang parser checking. Um, so for schema, uh, schema conformance, we want to do it pretty much per model tweak. And uh, the, ca the caching change that I made where you can specify a custom schema cache directory kind of enables this sort of behavior because you're allowed to mutate models um, for specific mounts while leaving the other ones intact. Another piece of advisory group feedback was, you know, loose mode should only apply when violations are not structurally ambiguous. So, you know, probably shouldn't try and parse bad XML, of course, or anything like that. But one thing we could do that makes it a little bit easier is, you know, inference, uh, inferences on the uh, namespaces. Right now, as you can see, like 75% of this payload is just the namespaces continually repeated. So if we could do something that, you know, infers the, uh, the namespace, um, it could help when uh, things don't actually uh, specify it. 
Uh, and there's also a desire for some sort of pass-through mechanism. So right now, when you do like a uh, you know get operational, it's going to go through uh, netconf northbound. It's going to grab it from the device. It's going to go back to open daylight. We're going to parse through it, and there may be optional. Uh, I mean, there may be some exceptions that we encounter. The idea right now is you know maybe we want to just get whatever the raw output the device is sending back. This could really help with debugging. So right now what I do is I, I use PyYang when uh, <laughs> something actually goes wrong to debug these issues. But we really ought to have a, a mechanism built right into Open Daylight to help with this. So you know, I do a get operational. I go out to the NetConf device. I get whatever payload back asynchron asynchronously. And it's returned to the user. And just display the raw response. We don't need to do anything special with it necessarily. And uh, this could even be helpful on an application level if applications don't deem that they need you know, very uh, strict parsing. Maybe they can use some of this and glean some of this data for something useful, even just displaying. So the, the biggest overall feedback that I got and what really sticks as you know, important to me is you know, expect the users to come up with the esoteric conditions down the road. Um, there are going to be devices out there, and I'm sure all of you have dealt with these lovely devices, that might not implement it correctly or fully standardized. And you have to realize that a lot of times it's easier just to maybe make a change in the Open Daylight server to be a little bit more accepting, rather than go out and you know upgrade firmware on 100 switches. Um, it's also, you know, we need some tolerance maybe in the acceptance uh, so that um, if we're in a deployment scenario, we can, we can change these sort of things on the fly. I like to phrase this as we shouldn't punish users for their vendors' bad behavior. Um, I think it, given that we're trying to provide software to users and make them happy. You want to give them the microphone? <laughs> I just like to phrase that as sort of an axiom, which is that we ought not to punish our users unduly for their vendor's bad behavior. Um, and I say this coming as a vendor from a vendor that has occasionally had bad behavior. So, like, but I think we all have. So it's probably like we have as Open Daylight developers, we have end users, and users want to actually use the product and get things done. We ought to make that possible um, and not hold them hostage until their vendors ship them new firmware. Well said, thank you. So I'm just going to give over, go over a few um, examples of plausible improvements that I've thought of based on the AG feedback. And uh, you know, some of these might be a little bit harder, um, might not be able to be done too easily. But there's certainly things to think about. And as we go into this, uh, this new planning session for the next release, things we ought to keep in our mind as possible improvements to make this a lot more usable. So uh, enhanced feedback and exceptions, I will you know, preface this with there was a lot of good work done by the NetConf team in Beryllium to uh, you know, clarify exceptions, et cetera. But we really do want to know what's wrong when a model is not able to be parsed. And uh, right now, it's very hard to determine. It's even hard to determine which model might have caused an issue. Um, Pass-through mechanism, right now I have to use Pying, which is a little bit embarrassing. We're in our third year of. Uh, development on open daylight and we, we have to rely on other tools sometimes to do this uh, debugging. Um, maybe a strategy implementation that allows looser interpretation of Yang. And that one I'll go into a little bit deeper here. You know, maybe assume a default type for a leaf if it does not exist. Um, you know, you might be saying you could just add it in the schema cache directory, which is true right now, but it's just a plausible um, improvement we could make. If a model does break uh, when when you mount a device, if one model is just uh, a bad model, we shouldn't you know, discount all other models. There might be still some useful information that you can, you can get. Um, for ranges, if you have uh, a range for a certain leaf, if something's out of range, maybe we should still allow it. That one might be a little <laughs> bit tougher, and I know that, <laughs> that goes into some binding stuff that even I'm, I'm not too familiar with, but uh, you know, just ideas. And uh, lastly, is actually one that Bala brought up, which is a more consistent RESTConf interface. Um, because you know, RESTConf usually is used to control NetConf. 
Um, there's NetConf northbound as well, the SSH interface, but. I just want to add uh, one point on that slide, actually. Uh, uh, the discount for uh, the uh, broken models, uh, there is a flag internally in the Yang tools, uh, do not do strict validation, but that is not exposed, uh, not bound when you mount the device. Uh, so internally, the strict validation is always assumed, so uh, it's always, uh, even if, uh, if there's a catastrophic uh, error in, in terms of parsing a model that occurs, the whole device is not mounted. So probably things like that could be surfaced, uh, not bound, so that the user of the device can determine whether that model is imported to him or not. Because uh, often it happened, uh, both in our experience, that there is one model that the user absolutely didn't care about. Uh, but because of error in that, we could not even able to mount the device. So that's the one thing. The, the last point is, uh, in some cases, we have seen uh, both uh, all of us here. Uh, Netconf is working, but the thing is, to reach Netconf layer, you had to go through RestConf. But the RestConf is kind of broken in terms of uh, some RPCs or some put requests and put some post requests. So we have fixed uh, many of those things uh, in uh, Beryllium and also in Lithium, uh, the, especially the put and the post. And we are still working on some of the RPC stuff. Uh, <coughs> And also, as a part of that, uh, there is another layer to this, which is the API Doc Explorer, which actually exposes all your models uh, from, for the programmers. Even there are issues there, too. I mean, uh, even though the rest conf is working, the API Doc Explorer has some issues. So there are multiple layers of issues, usability issues uh, that we have fixed, we have identified, and also we are working on some of those things. So lastly, it was just you know, kind of a slide to say, some discussion. Um, another funny picture on usability at the bottom here, um, but you know the whole reason for doing this wasn't to say, "Hey, what we have now is crappy." I think that's very good, but I, I wanted to kind of generate some discussion, and maybe if any of you have a any feedback from doing this yourselves and mounting your own devices, of ways we might be able to uh, improve NetConf. I felt like I was going to get an awkward silence here. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Oh, it definitely does help, but I, I don't know if it solves all. <laughs> yeah. The bigger problem with cloud loading schemas that I've found is figuring out, like just figuring out what needs to change. Like generating the correct side loaded schema is time intensive, error prone. Exactly. So the side loading, I, I, I had done that once actually because we were doing something with a bug and we, could, we had to side load. But the thing is, side loading, you had to ensure all the models, all the sub modules, all the dependencies. And if you see the payload of the thing, I mean, you have to give all the namespace, all the version number. It is so verbose that there is a 99.99% .99 of the chance that you go, will go wrong most of the time.
And it's sufficiently ambiguous that there is a follow-on RFC that describes additional, additional modes to enable that cause it to be used to explicitly state whether you want them or not. But without that extension, so there's enough ambiguity, even, even while saying that there's a purposes, there's enough ambiguity in the spec that I think that you need this. Um, even if vendors were, there was no cruddy implementation, that there, that, that there was a disagreement on the Yang tool's mailing list about whether that's you should or should not actually store and return default nodes in the Yang data store. Um, and, and I actually, having read the spec, I, I still think it says you should, but clearly I not everybody agrees. So, so that's just more example of you really do need something that looks like this. The side loading module would be quite good. Yeah, uh, regarding the RFC, since you brought it up, I just remember one instance uh, where RFC doesn't state anything. For example, the, this, is the, this is one of the use cases we uh, just went through, one of our own devices. It, depo it imports the same model twice. It's, it's really an uh, error in the young uh, writer, but it's not catastrophic. So they tested with other tools. They were happy with it. You import the same model twice. You give a different uh, uh, prefix, and the prefix is unique, and everybody's handling fine. Uh, whereas when we mounted on ODL, ODL did not like it at all because he's saying you are importing the same model twice. The vendor tells me, show me an RFC where, you, where it says you cannot import the same model twice. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's not a good, good practice. We agree to that. We are going to fix it. But show us in the RFC where it's not allowed. I mean, those kind of stuff. Probably we could have just handled it in, within the Yang tools. Yeah, I don't think that we're trying to promote bad behavior, uh, I, I, but... <laughs> Ryan, I think we need to spend five minutes about the fix that you did, uh, the, the uh, schema yeah. cache. Do you want to talk about the one that we have? I don't know. Your, your, your I think we should, we should tell how it, how it definitely solves the problem. You want, you want, to, you want to tell them? Uh, okay, I guess. <laughs> uh, I don't have, like, a demo or anything for you guys. It's, it's not, I apologize. Not a demo, yeah. So there, there's sufficient ambiguity if you don't actually... Uh, specify a revision date and a revision uh, and an import statement where you're supposed to just kind of assume that the the model that you're importing was the one that was available at the time what we ran into was uh, with I believe it was IETF I net types IETF, IETF uh, net monitoring yeah okay uh, we were importing uh, well so, uh, 2013 okay. version yes. <laughs> in, in our device uh, our devices all assumed that it was a 2013 version. Um, in open daylight, we, we assumed it was 2010 version. And uh, that was done because of various reasons. I guess that the resolution of revisionless imports was non-deterministic. So you didn't really know if you were going to get the 2013 or 2010 version. So you know what, we, what people in uh, Pantheon team did was uh, nicely add in the, the 2010 version so it was deterministic at least. You could figure out that, hey, I'm at least going to get this one. But, uh, you know, it kind of sucked if you, you assume the other way. So we assumed 2013. <coughs> what we did is we basically allowed you to uh, specify a schema cache directory. So I think all of you in this room are probably familiar with the fact that there's a, a cache directory with all the Yang models. Or, or maybe. <laughs> so there's a, there's a leaf now when you, when you mount that's exposed either... Um, it's in both spawning by topology configuration and loopback. So it's called schema cache directory. It'll allow you to put in a new directory where all the models will be loaded. So what that in effect allows you to do is go into that folder, change the model there to specify the 2013 version in our case, and uh, it won't affect the rest of the controller. So anything else using the IETF netconf monitoring still gets the default uh, file that was included in open daylight. Yeah, that, that's a great fix. Only one thing I want to add is this lets you uh, <clears throat> a facility where you can 
um, mention a device specific folder. Uh, traditionally, if you see, we have only one cache folder where all the young files for, from all the devices, including the ODL itself, is stored. So what that means is if a version is already there, it won't be downloaded from a device at all. For example, if a IETF INET type, types 2010 version is there, even if, it is, even, even if it's customized, if the version is not changed, from a device it won't be downloaded. This gives you the facility to provide a per device cache so that all the young files from a device can be self-contained and they don't, they don't have to work well with others. So this is extremely useful, if, especially if the standard uh, ID of files are customized for whatever needs. So that's, that's a great fix. Yeah, and the other nice thing about that one in particular, not to promote my own changes here, but uh, it, it, it's allowed to be reused. So say you have like tons and tons of Viata devices, for example, that did this one thing and it assumed one interpretation. You can just reuse it, so it's it's pretty efficient. How many people know what a PMCAST directory is? <laughs> well, Thomas, of course. <laughs> so that's the directory where all the YANG files are downloaded when you mount a device, including your own controller when you do a loopback mount. Yeah. So it downloads into the new folder, then you're going to have to edit it yourself and then restart the controller. It unfortunately requires that extra step at this point. But uh, as Bala mentioned, it, it's going to download the one that your device specifies. So if your, your device specifies it, you don't really have to do anything. Yeah. In our case, we we're, were pretty lucky with that. So. so even if that version file exists in the other cache, since you're specifying a new cache, that file from the device is downloaded, so everything is in sync. So yeah. even if other devices have mishandled the standard file, it will not affect your device because that folder is completely self-contained. And you only have the 2013 version in that case. Yeah. You don't have the 2010 version. Maybe Thomas can speak a little more. Yeah, it's it's highly tied to the Yang Tools parser. So. I think that, yeah, right now it's very strict, and uh, I guess that's the whole point of this talk is maybe we need to create some mechanisms to make it a little more friendly. So, yeah, the exposing that uh, do not do strict flag, not bound, is going to be really helpful because it's there in the code. The code handles it based on the flag and the young tools. A particular model is not, if, it, if you don't stay strict, even if it is that model is catastrophic error, it continues with the rest of the models. The functionality is there, but it's not exposed when you mount the device. Similar state with NetConf and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be careful up here. And, and I agree with you, there's a sweet 
about the balance of the experiment. Um, what it really comes down to is how many people here remember Signal? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who have not been doing this shit since the, the, mid, the early to mid 90s, Signal was the thing that you used to specify markup languages like HTML before XML. And it turned out that Signal was so freaking loosey goosey that it was almost impossible to write a really well performing parser for Signal. And it was almost impossible to actually reliably. So if you remember all the quirks mode bullshit, if you ever did web development in the IE5, IE6 time, that was exactly because yeah, Signal got the sweet spot wall in the opposite direction. I'm not saying we have it right here, but in the opposite direction. And the result was a bunch of garbage that you couldn't actually effectively work with. And so you get crazy insane behaviors, things like, you know, gee, if you put this magic element here, this other thing cascades out. Um, and so, you know, I agree that there's a balance, but we do have to be cognizant of the fact that it's actually too far to lose really the design. Yeah, well, that's not, I don't think anybody's asking for us to, like, say, like, build into a validation by default. I think what we're asking for is a way... We want the knobs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're nerds. We like knobs. Yeah. <laughs> You could do that. It should be. It, you can. You could do that. I mean, that's why if you if you give it up as a part of the mount device, you could say for this device, do not use a strict validation. You could do that. Yeah, that's a very valid argument, and, and Robert's made it many times. I agree with it. I think that they're, you know, having the ability to kind of control it, though, is... True, true. That, that, that's why if you, if you give it per mount device level, the, it's, it's, for example, if, you, if you're mounting a right. Juniper device or Cisco device, the user of the device knows, has intimate knowledge of the device. So device handles certain... Good point, Ed. Yeah.
that one level. What has driven this frustration is not sloppy Netcom kind of things. That is a manifestation of a deeper thing, which is that users have been left in a position where they do not have the tools they need to be able to get the things which they own behave, even though there are relatively straightforward ways that they could, that should be possible. And so, so if you make it so that way, applications are now the guardian of what is true and honest and good, and they still end up imposing the same pain and frustration on users, we haven't fixed the problem, we've just plugged it up one moment. Yeah, but again, the, the, the problem is, you actually get both sides of it, right? Yeah. So the application is the arbiter, if we plug that up one level, the application the application is strict, then uh, you're right, we sort of move that problem. But likewise, if we move the frustration from my my vendor syntax doesn't check out, and so I crap out early yeah. my vendor syntax, to my application not something it should never have gotten, and so my application craps out, You've also just moved the ball there. No, no, I, I, I agree, 100%. The sure. trick is just, users should be able to fix their tolerance of risk and whether or not they can fix the problem. And if it turns out it's fundamentally unsolvable, we haven't made anything work. We've just made it fundamentally, we've kept it fundamentally unsolvable. Or in your case, it depends a little bit in between states, they're like, I understand what I need to do. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and <laughs> the knobs. Yeah, the, the other thing is these knobs need not be mandatory. It could be just optional. Like there are so many optional fields today when you when you when you connect to device. So you can assume the defaults, which is what. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, this could be optional knobs that the user can use if they to call in spawn. If we provide the optional knobs, probably if somebody is using it, at least they'll be able to mount the device and use it and solve the immediate problem. <coughs> I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Something like proceed the information from the device. Yeah, this one. Oh. What, what is the issue here? Because this is a normal behavior. Oh. No, so right now when you, when you do something like get operational, it's going to go through the parser regardless. What we wanted to, uh, what we would ideally have is a, a piece of functionality. Maybe it's a different REST endpoint that you can hit that will just give you the raw output from the device. And this is very helpful with debugging. So you, you'll still see whatever your device is, you know, giving you back. Um, and maybe it won't be parsable, but it, it's right now the reality is you have to go and use something like Pi Yang 
to get. So, so other, 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 only other way is you had to set the debug level to trace or something, then dump, uh, dump all the communication from the device and everything, then dump the output. That's that's the one one way. But his suggestion is provide a, make it a yeah. make it make it a feature. That's really all I had. If anybody else has any other questions or comments. You would like to explain that the address or how do you foresee this feature? I would see it as an alternate REST endpoint. So right now we have get operational. There might be like another <laughs> REST endpoint that's passed through. Dump XM, <laughs> dump XML. Is this a diagnostic tool really? I mean, you, you could still even use that information in, in your application, maybe a UE, to, uh, to display what the actual operational raw output is. And it could help you debug possibly why it's not parsing correctly. Yeah, it, I mean, it helps as a tool even for vendors designing these devices. They, uh, they then have some, some feedback where they can actually go and adjust uh, their own models. Do we have anything else? Well, I guess uh, with that, you guys got a couple minutes back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean that seriously because one of the problems we have with our users is that they go to try and figure out what's going on, and they go to the mailing list, and then they stop because there's 50 of them. And um, uh, <laughs> well, um, so, so, so this has two really nice properties. One of them is it's strongly, and so, and so if you make it so that way, it's actually read from the module name. It, it strongly incentivizes people to make, to, to, to make their code out of the way or, or fewer exceptions. And whether or not that backfires will be by incentivizing people to just throw them off the stack to somebody else, we'll see. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, 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 so one of them is serious and one of them is not so serious. And the serious part is that people actually do really have trouble figuring out where to email. And so, like, I don't know, do any of you subscribe to a video like users? Okay.
when it emails it, it attaches to the carafe log too. <laughs> Yeah, a passwords in plain text. <laughs> you know, maybe my, my device doesn't have a, a, a type for a leaf, for example. And, uh, you know, I still want to use it. I still want to use the model. Maybe I can just assume the string type just so that it will load. Um, and, you know, the point at the bottom is she, this has to be optional. This has to be a strategy pattern. Because there's certainly a lot to be said that you know it's made it through the Yang parser checking. Um, so for schema, uh, schema conformance, we want to do it pretty much per model tweak, and uh, the ca the caching change that I made, where you can specify a custom schema cache directory, kind of enables this sort of behavior because you're allowed to mutate models um, for specific mounts while leaving the other ones intact. Another piece of advisory group feedback was, you know, loose mode should only apply when violations are not structurally ambiguous. So, you know, probably shouldn't try and parse bad XML, of course, or anything like that. But one thing we could do that makes it a little bit easier is, you know, okay, hi everyone. My name is Ryan Goulding. I'm from Brocade. This is my colleague. Yeah. So uh, today we had scheduled the topic on uh, netconf usability. This is kind of, you know, from AG feedback as well as our own personal experiences uh, dealing with it. So, um, kind of just a funny uh, cartoon here, but sometimes I guess we all feel like this when using NetConf. <laughs> I want to just put a disclaimer. I think, you know, the NetConf team does a, a stand-up job. This is meant to be constructive and just, you know, something then. <laughs> There are a lot of smart people in this room too, so if you if you feel like you have something to add to the conversation, we'll pass the microphone to you, and you know please feel free to pipe in. Um, so you know a lot of good features were added in, in Beryllium, um, some improved logging, uh, spawning via topology configuration instead of loopback, um, clustering, and I actually added the last one here, which is the custom schema cache directory per netconf mount which allows you to essentially uh, create a repository for each individual mount. So you can go into that repository and modify and munge the model if it doesn't seem to be uh, taking well. So as an outline, we're going to go over a little bit of advisory group feedback. Actually, most of this is driven by advisory group feedback. Then we're going to go through examples of you know, plausible improvements and discussion at the end. And again, I want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, I know this is kind of a formal sort of presentation right now, but please pipe in if you have anything that you want to add. I'd really enjoy hearing it. I think it's only going to lead to good things. So advisory group feedback. So the first piece of advisory group feedback that <laughs> I received was distinguish between NetConf protocol issues and Yang schema conformance in the payload. Basically what this means is when you do a netconf mount or, you know, a get operational or get config, <laughs> no worries. Uh, sometimes you'll get a really nasty, you know, uh, exception admitted from org open daylight yang tools, even though you're really doing netconf. And this is the point where, you know, they're kind of indistinguishable. Uh, netconf is definitely, you know, downstream of yang tools and highly dependent on it. So you know, the first point is really, we want to be able to tell what's going wrong when it goes wrong. We don't want just a Yang tool stack trace. Uh, they're very helpful, but unless you're directly involved in writing the code and you know Yang tools pretty well, you're probably not going to know what went wrong. Maybe your model is deficient and uh, don't really know where it is. At this point, too, it's very hard to tell which model actually broke the uh, whatever specific net comp operation you're performing. Another piece was, uh, you know, a loose mode. And uh, this is both for Yang and NetConf. This one's a little bit more debatable. I've heard both ways on this one. So, you know, when I talk to Robert, he often says that application developers really want to uh, depend on the model and the validity of the data as it's enforced by Yang. But there are certain cases where inference, uh, inferences on the uh, namespaces, right now, as you can see, like 75% of this payload is just the namespaces continually 
repeated. So if we could do something that you know infers the uh, the namespace, um, it could help when uh, things don't actually uh, specify it. Uh, and there's also a desire for some sort of pass through mechanism. So right now, when you do like a uh, you know get operational, it's going to go through uh, netconf northbound. It's going to grab it from the device. It's going to go back to open daylight. We're going to parse through it, and there may be optional. Uh, I mean, there may be some exceptions that we encounter. The idea right now is, you know, maybe we want to just get whatever the raw output the device is sending back. This could really help with debugging. So, right now, what I do is I, I use PyYang when uh, <laughs> something actually goes wrong to debug these issues. But we really ought to have a, a mechanism built right into Open Daylight to help with this. So, you know, I do a 